we were um, and then you know, the environment was changed up. The first time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. Adele with Social Impact Consulting. Hello everyone, my name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs, and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation, and civil society strengthening. So now, I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects, which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for watching the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series. Are you interested in sponsoring Dev Sector Series? Please call me at 234 703 As we spread your brand, we spread around the world. And as we do that, we are all changing the world. So let's work together. Contact me so that we can maximize social impact. I look forward to hearing from you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up for this week's session of the Development Sector Series, which is Dev Sector Series, okay? So make sure you like and share this broadcast so that we can reach more people, y'all. Let me know where you're watching from in the comments so that I can thank you personally. Follow and connect with me with, on all my social media handles for future updates. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Social Impact Consulting, the channel with a big blue S. So if you have any questions about the discussion of this program, which is really exciting today, please include in the comments so that we can engage in a robust discussion. So today, we are going to be having conversations on youth advocacy. And our guest today, Choma Abwebu, is the executive director of Tech Her NG, where she amplifies tech solutions to societal problems, especially affecting women and girls. She's a passionate development practitioner who has used technology in movement building across the country and has spoken around the world, provided support in campaigns such as Enough is Enough, Occupy Nigeria, Not Too Young to Run, and many others. So we're gonna be having a discussion today about youth advocacy. As you know, the, the largest and most rapid youth population in the world is in Africa. Okay, and we're going to be discussing the use of technology and citizen engagement amongst young people in our continent. So guess what, guys? I am going to be going over her bio in just a few seconds. Stay tuned. Is the executive director at Tech Her NG, demystifying technology for women and applying tech solutions towards societal problems especially as they affect women. Whether it's chaperoning young first-time women politicians, co-creating solutions for sexual and gender-based violence, or curating learning sessions on digital security and circumvention, Chioma believes that technology not applied is not useful. Chioma's foray into advocacy began in 2008 with the Light Up Nigeria movement. Since then, she has functioned in leadership teams for campaigns such as Enough is Enough, Gen Voices, Occupy Nigeria, Bring Back Our Girls, Not Too Young to Run, and now State of Emergency GBV. As a speaker, 
Chioma has graced podiums from The Hague to the House of Lords in London and across the African continent. In recognition of her work with women and politics, she was an inaugural speaker at the Global Women Leaders Forum in Iceland in November 2018. Chioma is an alumnus of the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers and served as the Deputy Curator and Communications Director of the Abuja Hub. She is an associate member of the Nigeria Leadership Initiative, a Commonwealth Associate Fellow and a member of the British Red Cross and Mo Ibrahim Foundation Now Generation Network. She currently sits on the boards of Plan International Nigeria and Oxfam International. Chioma has a bachelor's degree in mass communication from Ebony State University and a master's degree in social media from the University of Birmingham. Allow me to introduce to some and present to others Chioma Agwebu, Executive Director, TechHer NG. Hello, hello, Chioma. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That almost doesn't sound like me. It sounds like, <laughs> oh my God, who's that? <laughs> yep. That's you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited about this conversation that we're going to be having concerning youth advocacy because, lady, you are loaded in terms of, you know, strategy and creating these and mobilizing campaigns. And these are not small community campaigns. These are nationwide campaigns that have really affected lives across the country. Thank you so much for the work that you do. So, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's very awesome, nice. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So now let me ask you something. Um, so what is the historical context of youth advocacy, especially in Nigeria and Africa? I think essentially um, advocacy is typically born out of people feeling uncomfortable with the state of affairs. Right, and I, and, I, and I like to just define it simply like this because a lot of times people feel like advocacy is a calling for some, or it is something that some people have a responsibility to do. Um, but if you look at it as, I, Chama, I am unhappy with the fact that there are potholes on my street. And so I get the rest of the people on my street to write a letter to our local council representative to say, hey, what's going on with the potholes? They are very uncomfortable for us. We've had a couple accidents. What can you do about it? That's simply what advocacy is. Um, and, and so essentially it is, when you then talk about young people, you start to look at the need for inclusive governance, the need for representation of the needs of young people. You also need to think about you know, the, the urgency to change the status quo on issues that affect young people. So if, again, looking at Nigeria, you think about what's the rate of unemployment, right? Who does it affect the most? And um, when NSARS happened last year, it was also about, you know, young people. When Not Young to Run happened, you know, and culminated in the president signing the bill into law in 2018, it was also about, you know, young people. State of Emergency GBV is also about how do we, you know, pro um, how do we get the government to act urgently around sexual and gender-based violence? So it's, it's always around what are you trying to change? And then, of course, it can be youth advocacy, it can be women advocacy, it can be advocacy for babies, for instance, the calls to end FGM, child marriage, all of those types of things. But essentially, the underlying factor is how do we change the status quo? Interesting. Yeah. That is that is really something that you say that because you know you just explained how it can be affected uh, in, in even small communities you know, mm -hmm. in terms of how can you be a youth advocate? So mm -hmm. now, um, so now how has the youth movement affected policy development in Nigeria? Oh, that's a big, that's a big question. And one that's like, um, super interesting. Um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I started talking about not too young to run, you know, um, with the former question and led to a bill, a constitution amendment bill you know, um, that then, of course, gave birth to inclusion for young people, expanding the pool of candidacy so that young people can run for office, you know, ended up changing some of the age, um, 
the age limits for people to run for office. So, you know, really big change there. Constitution amendment, one of the most successful um, movements and advocacy causes in, in decades in Nigeria. Um, you also think about state of emergency, which we started last year. At the time, we started pushing for states to, you know, domesticate um, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. Um, there were about 15 states that had done it at the time. Now we're up to 23, and that nice. conversation is ongoing. Um, bring back our girls of 2014. The call was to ensure that the girls that were kidnapped from Chibok were brought back. And I think it's important to state here that in, in, in deciding to undertake advocacy, you really have to think about what is the answer that I'm going for. And it's also important to realize that sometimes you might not get the exact answer you're going for, but you learn lessons. For instance, we don't have all the girls back. But what Bring Back Our Girls managed to do was it started a very serious conversation on the state of security in Nigeria. It exposed people to you know, government spending on security. It also challenged people to become very involved in questioning you know, the government and holding people to account. Um, you also have to think about Occupy Nigeria. That had to do with former President Goodluck Jonathan you know, unilaterally, like almost unilaterally, increasing the price of fuel in 2012. And when people went on the streets, both in Nigeria and outside the country, those prices were reduced. So every time you go out to do something or every time you lean on people to do something, there's always a change, right? I mean, if you also think about mm -hmm. Save Bagega, I think of 2011, you know, yes. it was led by Hamzi you know, with the, the remediation that was needed in Zamfara, with the lead poisoning, etc. Let it, that, that entire episode led to children's lives being saved, led to the soil being, you know, the remediation of the soil, but also forced the duty bearers to use the monies for that which the monies were intended. Um, so it does, it does lead to policy change. It also leads to, sometimes, it, it, sometimes you might just be advocating for people to be aware. And I think this this is a lesson we've seen over and over again when you talk about sexual and gender-based violence, because a lot of times, mm -hmm. if you ask how many people have raped a girl, sometimes mm -hmm. the number is not, you know, is not significant. I mean, it is significant, you know, but then when you ask how many people have catcalled, how many people have groped, how many people have assaulted, how many people have coerced, how many people have shame the girl into having sex with them how many people have done this you know you you see that the the scope of offense is so much wider and so a yeah. big chunk of sexual and gender-based violence advocacy is actually letting people know what is wrong and what is right and mm -hmm. how things that they thought were jokes that actually you know could actually be across the lines of criminal activity so yeah i see okay so now i just want to just kind of go deeper into the question as well so as so as a youth as a young person now how do you am i still a young person are we still young we get no we get up there <laughs> <laughs> so um but okay so for us to now advise young people uh so um that they want to advocate for things that they don't like like for like for example last year we had the NSAS. Um, mm -hmm. campaign and protest i still call it a movement because it's not over um mm -hmm. so like what would you what how what would you advise a young person that wants to start some sort of movement in their community and kind of moving it forward um uh, this is a great question and i think i spoke about this a few days mm -hmm. ago um mm -hmm. on on a live with pastor itwa igodalo and okay. i said i think there were like six things that i said and the first mm -hmm. thing i said was you need knowledge so what do you want to advocate about? Quick example, um, you want to advocate for, let's say, gay rights in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Nigeria has, a, has an SSMPA, right, which is the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, which mm -hmm. is ambiguous, which is verbose, which is a pretty rubbish bill. Mm -hmm. However, it is, it, it's law in Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. So in deciding to advocate for the rights of LGBTQIA, you have to be very aware of what that law says so that you don't contravene that law in trying to advocate for something. Do you understand? If you're trying to advocate for or advocate against child marriage in states, you have to realize that if they haven't passed the Child's Rights Act and if they haven't passed the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, those are the first things you should be starting with so that you can create the enabling law to punish people who do that. So knowledge is like super, super important. Very, very, very important. The next thing you want to do is you want to really think about 
So now that I know the law, now that I'm very sure what my problem statement is, what mm -hmm. am I going to do? And then when you thought about, okay, well, we need to advocate for this to happen. We need to advocate for that to happen. You go back to knowledge, which is, if I'm advocating in the North, are there any particular things that I need to think about? If I'm advocating in the South, are there things I need to think about? Quick example, when I was, um, I, I produced radio drama for the BBC World Service Trust back in 2010. But mm -hmm. then I had colleagues who were working on an output um, that was dealing with, you know, sexual behaviors for young people. And it was interesting that the way you talk about sex in the North is different from the way you talk about sex in the South. I see. The way you talk about contraception in the North is very different from the way you talk about it in the South. Both mm -hmm. of them against it, right? So in the North and in the South, they're against contraception, but for very different reasons. So to be That's able to advocate in each of these locations, you have to be very clear so that you don't end up offending the people you're trying to advocate for. And then you need to build a team, right? So you, you, you have some knowledge, you've built your convictions, you have thought through how you're going to get this work done. You need to build a team. Who is the person that's good with press releases? Who is the person that's good with the local language? Who is the person that's good with strategy? Who is the person that's good with rofo rofo, right? When you need to get down and dirty and go to the community and you know just really immerse yourself. Who is the person that's good with that? Who is the person that can engage with legislators and speak all the English that's necessary? Who is the person that can talk to the press? Who is the person that can break down all the information into bite-sized pieces that everyone can understand? You need a team. And then after that, all of you need to decide what does success look like? What are we trying to achieve? What does it, if we get, for instance, if we go to the police and we want to do a protest, if the, if the PRO comes out to talk to us, is that success or are we going to stay there till the IG comes out? You need mm -hmm. to define that. And the reason why you define that is so that everybody has one, one focus, one goal. No one's deviating. You also, it's also in that time that you think about language. What are we saying? What do we want to say? Because comms is important. And once you have various people talking about various things, then it means that there's some confusion, right? And you don't want that because you don't want people to take advantage of the confusion to cause trouble. Um, and then, of course, you then deploy. You go on social media, you go online, you go offline, whatever it is that you want to do. Of course, part of the knowledge is understanding, you know, what permissions you need. So if you want to gather people together, you must inform you know, for instance, road safety, et cetera, if you're going to be blocking road stuff so they can just help with the coordination. Um, and then periodically you need to review. One of the things that we did with the Not Young to Run movement was we asked people online, um, what are some things you don't like about this bill? And then leaning on the things that they said, we were then able to craft communications to respond to that. So instead of saying, no, don't criticize what we're doing, we asked them, what are your criticisms? So that we would answer them. And in doing so, we're able to turn a lot of cynics into believers. And they then started pushing that movement, right? So it's super, super important to, knowledge is, is important. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is what will carry you through. Knowledge is, the, is, is what gives birth to the convictions that you have that mean mm -hmm. that you don't deviate from what you went out to do. So I yeah. See. I think that is that is so key. That that's that is so key in terms of knowledge, um, to knowledge of what is going on and the environment and what is needed in those communities. Okay, so now we're gonna go into what and I feel I feel like this is gonna be the we're, we're, we're hitting the meat of this our conversation. So what are some of the recent campaigns that stand out in Nigeria and even other countries? And what do you think are the are the outcomes that we see out of those? Um something about movement is that mm. they are very, very easily replicated, right? Because the truth is, the problems we have in America, we have them here. The problems that are in Sudan, we have them here. The problems here, we have them in Ghana, in Somalia, you know, pretty much everywhere, right? Um, as we all know, there seems to be like a wave of coup d'etats, you know, happening across the continent. Because again, you know, and these things arise from, you know, I mean, forget the obvious, you know, misbehavior by the military, but there's also a feeling, they arise from a feeling of, you know, people not, people not, feeling like they're included, you know, there's no inclusion. They don't feel like their voices are represented in government. They don't feel like the people who are in office or in power, you know, are listening to them. And that's where all of these feelings of disillusionment and discontent start to breed. 
-hmm. So what are some of the most popular? If you look at the Me Too movement in America, right, that kind of mm -hmm. jumped out from there and started spreading, it led to yes. Arawa Me Too in Nigeria. It led to North Normal in Nigeria, right? Um, uh, founded and co-founded by Fakria, um, Hashim, Hassan Namina, you know, Farida, Damu, those, you know, really, really courageous ladies. So, so there was that. Um, you also have Not Too Young to Run, which also, you know, gave birth to a few countries on the continent with young people saying, you know what, we are the largest demographic, we deserve to have a say in how we are governed. And there's also, you know, South Africa had Fees Must Fall, uh, we also had Women's March. And I think, again, the Women's March that has happened, I think now in Senegal, in Nigeria, in Zambia, Zambia was the most recent, um, mm -hmm. I think in Kenya as well. It's just mm -hmm. women saying, we want to feel protected. Sexual and gender-based mm -hmm. violence is a cancer that's destroying our nation, right? There's no excuse to assault a lady. There's no excuse to take advantage of a lady. There's no excuse, none you know, to take from a lady when she has not freely um, and enthusiastically given you, you know, given you her body. And one thing I like about movements and campaigns is that each one strengthens the next one. So like I like to say, um, RSVP and Light of Nigeria of 2008 mm -hmm. meant that our voices were strong enough for enough mm -hmm. is enough Nigeria in 2009. 2012, you know, um, Occupy Nigeria meant that 2014 bring back our voices had a strong voice you know also meant that not too young to run had a stronger voice meant that open nas right of 2012 mm, with enough yes. enough nigeria had a strong voice meant that end SARS could build on all of the lessons from these former campaigns to say you know what we don't want a leader we don't want one person that will bear the brunt of, of, of this movement. We want to be, mm -hmm. you know, we want to be rudderless. Mm -hmm. We want to be, you know, independent in our thinking. We also want to be, um, we want to be fluid. You know, and I think one of the beautiful things about NSAS was it was so agile. It's like, it should be a, a master class in, you know, in, in agile project management, because as the government was throwing up, you know, whatever it was throwing up, hindrances, mm -hmm. barriers, curve balls, the movement was adapting across the country. You know, if, if it rains, how do we get umbrellas or raincoats across the country? If people get arrested, how do we raise a team of lawyers to be able to respond? If people get beaten, they get thrown in hospital, how do we create a network of medical personnel who can check on these people, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was beautiful. And each movement gives rise to the next. And this is why I, I keep saying that, you know, governments need to become as responsive as possible because this generation, they're not here to play. You're very right about that. Um, okay. So it looks like, um, um, it looks like the LinkedIn followers, um, if you're not getting this broadcast via audio or via, um, uh, via your mobile phone or what have you, just know that I will be rebroadcasting this uh, live broadcast again after, after we're done, if you're not getting this on LinkedIn Live. If you are and you have any questions, please put it in the comment section and we'll be happy to answer those questions if you're watching from, um, from your laptop or your desktop. Thank you again, everyone, for, for um, staying tuned. Please, if you have any questions, like I said, please put it in the comment section so that we can continue to um, have this conversation, okay? All right, everyone. So um, let me go to the next question. That was quite comprehensive, you know, with the various mm -hmm. campaigns in the Africa. So now we're gonna be talking about tools. So um, since technology has become a very effective advocacy tool, how has that impacted movements and how can, a young people um, use the tool of technology if they even want to start something right now in their communities. Mm. Um, so let's let's draw a little comparison between okay. Enough Is Enough Nigeria of two thousand and nine, and um, you know NSAS of last year. So two thousand and nine, mm. when we were organizing, um, I remember we were meeting in Audue Kuri's restaurant in Abuja. He used to have a Chinese restaurant. He and his wife himself. Mm -hmm. And we would 
call each other on phone, we would text each other. I think we were all using Blackberries at the time, very yeah. limited in their functionality. Um, we would take pictures, you know, with cameras because, you know, the phones weren't that good. Um, and I was recently just looking through the archives of, you know, of material that I had, and I'm just like, wow, you know. Um, but fast forward to 2020, we were live streaming from our phones, mm. right? Um, um, media like CNN and Al Jazeera were taking live feeds from people on the street. You know, things have changed. We were organizing mm. via, you know, via really, really different means. People were donating via transfers. I mean, back in the day when we were organizing um, for Enough is Enough Nigeria, we donated cash, you mm. know, because a lot of people didn't want to have to go to the bank to fill out a form to do a transfer. Things have really changed. Mm. Now, 20, 2020, when Femco's bank accounts were, you know, were blocked, people started donating Bitcoin. It's really incredible, you know, how things have changed, um, how conversations have evolved. I remember that Techcar, um, after the NSAS protests, we convened an event and we also produced a piece of research on how movements have evolved over the last 10 years, but also the role of women in the leadership of movements over the last 10 years. And it's actually a remarkable piece of work. Uh, we hope to launch it in October, you know, to commemorate okay. um, you know, the first anniversary of NSAS. Um, but but things have really changed. You also have to look at, you know, the organ, I've talked about the organizing. You have to look at the aesthetics and how it affected, you know, the flow of information. So even if it's communicating with the press, communicating across the country, debunking misinformation, right? Or challenging disinformation. Um, they're really, really special tools. Um, people have built, you know, programs, I, I was reading up about, you know, a group in, in I think, East Africa that created a game that just helps to educate people about sexual and gender-based violence, right? Yeah. So movements are, movements are changing, movements are changing really rapidly, right? There, I've actually been a part of conversations recently about um, halting gender-based violence perpetrated online, which is a completely new phenomenon. So what I'll say is, as we continue to see the advancement in advocacy and the advancement in movement, we must also realize that the evolution of technology throws up new forms of abuse, new forms of violence, and new forms of challenges, really, you know, for advocates, for digital rights folks, et cetera. Um, we have now the advent of like deep fakes. We have the advent of, you know, the invasion of privacy um the the harvesting of a person's data to harm them um so it's like there's always two sides right so there's the there's the plus side of things but then there's also the um the negative side of things but we must you know um i, I like to say remain positive and also kind mm -hmm. of like continue to think about how can i use this for the good the good for which it, you know the good for which it was intended yeah okay so um now like you you talked about that um with with the advent of technology there are now challenges especially the harvesting of people's data um and and um, um i think i listened to your presentation um, a few months i think it was sometime last year or early this year where you have now online troll farms uh and and, and various things that are out there to um dissuade activists can you talk a bit more about that so we've talked about the advantages let's talk about some of the challenges that activists have to face due to technology um so digital rights activists, and to, to be to be fair, like really anyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I, I, I like to say that technology is like a knife. You can peel an orange, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can stab a person. It's, it just depends on who's wielding the technology. Um, and it's just like they say, oh, this person is a mean person online. It just means that they're a mean person offline because it is who you are that is channeled, you know, um, via the platforms that you that you use. Um, and and so yes, with the with the challenges that people might face online, um, troll farming is is a really big thing to be honest because mm -hmm. you can you can you can force disinformation just by having a good number of people saying the mm -hmm. same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can also create you know um, you can also create pockets of 
how do I explain? Mm -hmm. For instance, you have you have a troll farm, right? You mm -hmm. have paid a number of people. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. Nigeria is so poor that it is so mm -hmm. incredibly easy to weaponize that poverty and have like mm -hmm. a bunch of young people, young men, young women, who, if anybody says something bad about Choma, they attack the person. Mm -hmm. What they're saying about Choma could be true, but these people just attack and attack and attack. And over time, you create mm -hmm. a an atmosphere of fear because nobody wants mm. to be attacked. Nobody wants anyone digging into their lives and bringing out things mm -hmm. about them online. I remember that last year, a few friends of mine and I worked on a case where it was alleged that a celebrity had raped a young woman, right? And mm -hmm. one of us had her address put out online, like her physical address, the number what? of her street, the number of her house. What? You know, because, yeah, because fans of, or fans of this celebrity were like, how dare you talk about our beloved celebrity, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, you can, people can piece together bits of information on your life and put it out online, you know, or they can use that to harm you, or they can use that to send you threatening messages, etc. Or they can take a picture of your, you know, of your face and put it on a naked body and then put it online mm. and then it appears like your nudes have been leaked. You know, and all of these things, all of these things happen. All of these things happen. I remember that a young woman was going to run for office in 2019 in a state. I'm not going to say the region. And mm -hmm. the men in the region were so repulsed and so offended that she wanted to run that they they took a picture of her face and put it on the post on the on the body of a known prostitute in the community. And then they put those posters around town. And so her father said to her, you know, you are bringing shame to the family and you cannot continue on this path with your political ambition. So these things have real consequences, you know, they really do have real consequences. Unfortunately, Nigeria doesn't have a data rights and privacy law in, in place. Um, the, the one that was submitted to Mr. President, he turned it down. So there are really no protections as far as people's data is concerned. You could go to an event for for a cooking show, for instance, and drop your details. And then two days after, you know, somebody's, somebody who runs a, a marketing firm is sending you a message because they've harvested your data from the cooking show. There are no repercussions for that. You can't try that outside Nigeria, right? Mm -hmm. It's been said that if you want to buy the entire database of voters registered with INEC, it's online. You could Google it and buy it as a, a criminal. It shouldn't be available. But there are people waiting to sell that data without the consent of the owners of the data. So, you know, there's a there's a there's a real big, you know, yeah, there's there's a lot wow. of work that needs to be done in that regard. As far as protecting people's data, as far as punishing people who abuse the rights of others, especially online, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Interesting. The answer yeah. is, however, not banning things. It is not mm -hmm. banning Twitter, it is mm -hmm. not banning cryptocurrency. No, it's a lot more education. And like I said before, it's a lot more knowledge needed to make the right decisions and stuff, yeah. Wow, that is quite comprehensive. And it, it, it yeah. even um, alludes to us even being more vigilant in terms of us releasing our data. Um, um, I had a conversation with Benga last week, which alluded to some of this conversation, but it was not uh, in depth like this in terms of what mm -hmm. is going on with uh, uh, with our data uh, in Nigeria, so that so we are in a bit of a conundrum then. So the advantages are good, and then you mm -hmm. have the disadvantages as well. The risks, yeah, yeah, some of the risks, and um, so. But uh, but I know that uh, TechHa uh, um, provides um, trainings at times for people uh, uh, concerning data privacy and how they can uh, uh, make sure that um, at least able to mitigate some of that risk so yeah. um yeah so that that is really um, great work that you're doing so um we're gonna go to our next question so you've talked about some examples of how state actors have responded <laughs> in response to digital movements and the more and the most popular one that we have is uh, is the twitter band so um so are there some other examples you can you can um, highlight in terms of, especially with what happened with NSARS, uh, that's the more recent one. So what, how have they responded 
to to um, some of these digital movements, aside the more popular one, the unfortunate uh, uh, um, shooting that happened on the twentieth of last of uh, October last year. Uh, are there some other examples that we can highlight as well? Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm with. Yeah, you, you, you muted yourself. On mute. <laughs> ah, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, so I was saying that um, even the fact that citizens feel like they can come out and hold their leaders to account and ask, you know, various questions about a bunch of things, that's really special. The fact that citizens can listen to their legislators say something. For instance, I think around the time of NSARS, there was a legislator who said something about women getting abused and how, you know, he, he almost as to have put the responsibility on women and talked about, you know, um, it, it depends on what they wear, da, da, da. and people came for him so bad. He then gave an interview in a newspaper and he said, I haven't been able to sleep. <laughs> for the past two days, people have called every phone number I have. I have text messages. I have WhatsApp messages. So I want to apologize that that's not what I meant. You know, I probably said it wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that in itself is a form of advocacy. It is the type of advocacy that tells legislators and people in office that we are watching you, and you are supposed to to serve us. And if you don't do as you're supposed to do, we're going to come for you. I think that people holding Elisha Abu, you know, the woman beater, uh, the senator who's a woman beater, people holding him yes. to account online and offline is really special. I think that as citizens continue to express that power, the power that they have, um, it continues to grow. It's like you're flexing a muscle, right? You go to the gym and you're lifting weights. Your muscles continue to build strength. Right, so with state of emergency GBP, one of the things that we were, we were really particular about was equipping citizens with the knowledge that they needed to call their legislators and say, come, why is my state red on this map? Why haven't we passed the bar? Why haven't we adopted the CRA? Why aren't we protecting women and children in this state? So for me, all of those types of things are like big examples because it's the little, little actions. It doesn't have to be NSARS. Because to be honest, if we had been pushing as hard as we needed to push over the last 20, you know, 25 years, we probably wouldn't have to get to this NSARS point. If, and, and that's the thing, I, I liked when you said NSARS, it wasn't a one-off activity, it's a movement. Because we must sustain that pressure. The fear that government felt last year was super special because yeah. it was like, we can't control these people. We don't understand if they're coming from the left or from the right, from the front, from the back, from the bottom, from the top. We just know that there's a bunch of angry young people, right? And even though they bungled it in the end, horrendously, um, the awareness and the awakening in the hearts of people that look, you can and you should and you must continually hold your government to account, you know, um, um, it's, it's, it's a really special thing. And so we saw the government respond for state of emergency. We saw the government respond. We saw Femi Bajabia Mila, Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, who is the, um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He sent letters to the State House of Assembly who had him pass the VAP, encouraging them to do so. A good number of them have passed it since then. For not too young to run, we saw Mr. President sign the bill into law. We saw State House of Assemblies pass the bill, you know, um, sign, say yes to the bill. I think we ended up getting 33 out of the 36 states when we only get 24. So we've yeah. seen overwhelming response. You know, for Occupy Nigeria, I mentioned before, we saw the price of fuel reduced for Bring Back Our Girls. We saw governments taking charge of the recovery, you know, in response to, you know, to the kidnapping of the Chippewa girls. You know, we, we, we have seen some responses for open NAS. It took seven years, but the National Assembly finally opened up their, you know, their books to the public. So we have seen state actors respond. But I think for me, the, the more beautiful wins are the little everyday actions. Because every time you see a little thing happen, you further strengthen citizens to know, oh, if this could happen, then that can happen. 
Interesting. Um, 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 thanks for, for even answering the question from both sides mm -hmm. in terms of the positive, what this has positively done in our democracy, um, which is which is really interesting. And, and those are some great examples. Now we're going to now discuss about the shrinking civic space. Okay, mm. we, that's a that has been a huge matter of discourse over the past uh, past couple of years now, especially um, after NSAS, during and after NSAS. So, how has this affected youth advocacy, and what are, what steps can we take as citizens to keep the civic space open? Mm. So, how has it affected youth advocacy? I think we should start mm. by you know de defining what the what the civic space is, you know, and then of course going to how it has shrunk. I think civic spaces simply, very simply refer to spaces where citizens can speak, can raise their voices, can talk about things that affect them, can, you know, ask questions, can hold leaders accountable, can complain about things that they don't like, can offer solutions to a government, to the government that they elected to represent them. You know, that's that's what your civic space is really. It's a space where citizens feel like their voices count, their voices matter, and issues that they have will be dealt with swiftly, you know, by, by the government of the day. Now, how have civic spaces in Nigeria shrunken over the past few years? First of all, the government has, and it's not just this government, it's the one before them as well, has invested very heavily in surveillance equipment, right? Um, so we have patronized circles, um, we have patronized all sorts of people, spending, you know, really ridiculous sums of money on, on surveillance. Um, we have enacted, you know, horrendous policies. For instance, um, need, even look at need, right? Why do you need people's data when you don't have a Data Privacy Act? That protects the use of that data, that protects the storage and the utility of that data. Um, that recently, so the, I think it was NCC that said they were going to require citizens to give them the IMEI numbers of their phones, which means that you not only want to be able to track what I'm using the phone to do, you want to be able to tell the precise location of devices. Why? For what reason? You know, we've seen the National Broadcasting Commission come up with policies for broadcasters. You know, we've seen the verbose and really ambiguous clauses like anything that embarrasses the government. Who decides that? Exactly. Who decides that embarrasses the government, right? Exactly. We've seen sanctions, you know, wielded very freely against what happens. We've seen, you know, arrests. Yeah. Governors have become increasingly brazen in arresting people who they feel have embarrassed them or people who have made them look bad. Um, so yes, the, 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 the space is, is shrunken, right? And it continues to shrink as, as the day goes. And what that means is people become afraid. I think I talked about you know the, the pervasiveness of the fear that people feel in Nigeria. People have been disappeared and we've never seen or heard from them again, right? So, 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 and that fear is terrible because it means that if somebody wants to speak up about something, they're, they're also thinking, oh, what could happen to me for speaking up? Exactly. I know how we thought about things, you know, that we need to say, and it's just like, Ugh, what's the safest way to put this out? You know, what are the precautions to take in putting this out? There are real consequences, right? There were women who served food at the NSAS protests who had their bank, bank accounts locked. There were people who donated who had their bank accounts frozen. You know, there were people whose passports were seized. There were people who were arrested from their homes because they were tweeting, even after the protests were done. And what that does is that it makes people afraid, right? Um, and, and I think people, I think oftentimes people miss the fact that if you are handed a conviction in court, you know, you are, you have a conviction. And that stays with you for the rest of your life. So these types of things just make people afraid. There have been policies, you know, intended to, as it were, whittle the power of civil society or yes. kind of like whip civil society into in, in line. So you tell them that, you know, I mean, we've seen the the failed NGO bill, the failed social media bill, you know, and all of those types of things. We've seen the, you know, at some point during during the pandemic, they wanted to have the infectious diseases bill, which in addition to being, you know, um, about infections, infectious diseases, had clauses that were just going to grant like unilateral powers to, you know, it's like, um, yeah. 
So what can we do? Moving away from all of that, what can we do? Mm-hmm. I think the louder our voices are together, the safer we all will be. Mm-hmm. And I keep talking about spreading risk. So if I, Chema, for instance, send an FY request to a government agency, they can decide to rough handle me or whatever. But if 20 of us send it, how many of us do you want to arrest? Exactly. If 20 organizations sign a letter, that's why I like civil society and, you know, the the joint signatories on, on communication to government, you know, mm-hmm. um, and the endorsement by a lot of organizations, because which ones do you want to arrest? Which ones do you want to punish? You know, I think it also behoves civil society organizations to ensure that all of their documentation is intact. Exactly, yes. So that literally when you're coming to equity, you're coming with clean hands and you're coming with yes, hands that yes, can yes. be you know, that cannot be questioned or whatever. But yeah, I, ultimately, I think our voices together is a really, really powerful thing. Yeah, that is that is so true in terms of making sure that we're able to spread the risk. In fact, I released a, uh, a YouTube video um, which talked about um, nonprofit compliance and talking about the civic space that if you're going to be, um, be out there and be a pressure group, you have to have clean hands because they will you know, that there's a chance that they will come after you so that everything is, is where it needs to be. Um, this is, is really something, but like you said, once we're able to spread the risk and come together, um, then that way, you know, you can't arrest everybody. <laughs> you know, you can't harass everybody. So uh, that, that, is, that is really something. So I'm gonna go to our next question. Now, um, so after this question, we're going to have um, questions from the audience. So start flooding in your questions, okay? Because this is the last question after um, before the questions start flooding in. So um, we're now looking to the future. So what do you think the future of youth, what do you think is the future of youth advocacy and how does it affect the future of Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa? You alluded to some campaigns in some other countries. So maybe kind of giving us a sense of what our future looks like. I think we will keep learning, you know? Um, I think that this generation, the one before it, the one to come, they will keep learning from the mistakes. They will keep learning from the successes um, and they will keep learning from the strategies that have been employed for the you know, movements before them. Um, and it can only get better. What I would really like to see though, is us moving from, um, let's say, 90% advocacy and 10% uh, government action. So like 50% government action and 50% advocacy. And by that, I mean, it would be great to see an increased number of government folk from within advocacy circles, right? Um, I, I think that I think that, that would be really special. Um, I, also, I also hope that as we continue to go along, we can reverse some of the policies that are, you know, anti-people. For instance, the SSMPA, it's not a useful, you know, it's, it's not useful. It was a political bill, which has no, you know, which should have no place in our constitution, right? Also, the Cyber Crimes Act, for instance, is a very heavy-handed, you know, again, ambiguous piece of legislation, um, which I think should be redone. I know that currently some people are reviewing the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act mm-hmm. um, as passed in 2015 because even that, while it is the most comprehensive piece of legislation on sexual and gender-based violence, there are still gaps, right? So I, I hope that the future of advocacy leads to widespread you know, changes um, where they can be constitutional, yes, where they can affect our laws, yes, because that's the only way you can ensure that they are sustainable and will not be affected by the government in power, right? Um, how do the the changes or how do uh, the, the how how will the work that we do as advocates affect Sub-Saharan Africa? Nigeria, as we know, is the giant of Africa, right? As far as I'm concerned, only in size at the moment. But the two things that what we do in Nigeria has widespread effect. On, on countries around us, on the rest of the continent. And so I think that as we continue to like lift our voices and speak about things that matter to us, we encourage young people across the continent to also do the same. One thing I like to do on social media is when I see women you know, across the continent really advocating about sexual and gender-based violence, I amplify it. 
using my social media so that they get more coverage so that their voices are even louder and i think that's a role that you know nigeria can play as far as advocacy is concerned we can we can strengthen the voices of others you know we can support the advocacy yeah mm, that, that's really so remember what happened in uh, uh uganda and when there was um you know they were really rough handling um the opposition bobby wine and yes, everything i like i like the way yeah. we handled um the way you know we activists handled that that uh campaign mm -hmm. so i think more of that and i think that is what uh a technology has really done for us it has mm -hmm. really made africa more holistic and uh, whole as looking at each other as their brother's keeper so mm -hmm. um so uh, thank you for that. We have a question from the audience. Keep them coming, guys. So we have one from um, Mrs. Patricia Ujama. She said, how do we get government to dialogue with youths of NSAS who are still out there watching and waiting for the right moment to show that they are not here to play? Mm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now what? Um, Like I said earlier, I think that the government missed a really, really big opportunity with NSARS to build faith with young people, to build legitimacy with young people, but also to show itself as a government that truly cares. It started out on the right path, but then I think that they were misinformed, misguided, and then that led to the fiasco and the really, really, you know, horrendous um, string of activities that we then saw. So how can government, how can we get government to dialogue? I think that this first anniversary of NSARS provides a unique opportunity for citizens to press. You know, whether it's asking questions via local media, whether it's asking questions via social media, whether it is writing letters to their legislators, whether it is publishing articles, you know, there are so many opportunities for us to continue to lean into this thing because the truth is from the time of NSAS there have still been people killed by the police I read um I read an article recently of an actress who was coming home from you know somewhere and the police shot her in the shoulder you know I think because she said maybe they were calling her she didn't respond or so and the person just pointed at her and shot yeah and, and so it's the, you know, we, we talk about people being trigger happy, you know, but there's also the, there's also a lack of consequences, mm -hmm. right? So people just do as they want because they know nothing's going to happen. So I think, you know, continuously engaging governments via, you know, writing letters, engaging them so on social media um, is, is really critical to ensure that the momentum from NSAS isn't lost. But also, like she said, you know, that, we we continue to show government that look we're not here to play and this is something that not only affects us it concerns our lives really yeah you know yeah that 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 is really that is really something uh um that's a really really uh good answer because we it, in terms of what's what's the way forward and we need to kind of keep things going um i i uh had a conversation with dr Kole shetima on on this platform and there was something he said he said that um that the media organizations social media or whether it's uh, tv radio or print they bring out the breaking news but it's up to advocacy organizations and citizens to just kind of keep the story going and not let it die so um, that that's a really really good point so um well so do you have so do you have any final thoughts for us um final thoughts keep speaking and i say this everywhere because the more you speak you know the more our voices are heard the more you can amplify the voices of others um yeah so just keep speaking don't stop speaking don't stop seeking knowledge um yeah keep speaking Thank you so much. This was such, uh, uh, you, okay, you did not disappoint though. This, this, this was a great conversation in terms of talking about youth advocacy. Like advocacy is my juice. So it was really, this was really good in terms of really giving us some, some, some 
context about movement building um, in Nigeria. I have one last question. So okay. now you had, um, so like the old activists, you know, the ones pre-independence, and then you now have the young uh, uh, activists now that are pushing forward with technology. And, you know, I think they say the post Facebook generation. So how do we, um, how do we come together and talk about, okay, these were the lessons we learned pre-independence, how we had to dodge from the military era to get democracy to now, how do we make this democracy work? How can we get this synergy going so that it can further empower youth advocacy in Nigeria? I think we should have more conversations. Um, and, I, and I think that we're already on the path to that. Mm -hmm. I've been invited to two conversations, one in Ohio and one in Lagos this year alone, mm -hmm. just bringing younger activists and older activists together um, to, to talk through, this is how we did it in our time. This is what you're doing now. Here's how we can help. Here are some mistakes we think you're making. Here are some ways you can strengthen the work that you're doing. Here are some ways that you can do this or do that or do that and the other. So I think that that's already in play. I think we need to have more of them. I think they should be a little more expanded. And like I said in the second, you know, at the second event that I was invited to, that if I'm invited to a third, I won't go because it means that they're inviting the same people. Mm. So don't don't stop don't stop inviting me. Invite other young people and hear from them as well. You know, um, so yeah, I think that those conversations must continue to happen. Um, I also think that we must invest in 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 documenting things that have happened, um, so that we don't have people, you know, revise history um, as we go along. But conversations are super important; they're already happening. I just think it should happen a lot more. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Choma. This is not going to be our last conversation. We're looking at um, doing a civic space discussion series mm -hmm. uh, where we're now going to be expanding the scope of, uh, of uh, civil society because a lot of people just still say civil societies are NGOs and the civil society are the people living in the society and the various groups and, 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 and subgroups that make up the society as a whole. So we're going to be having a more robust conversation so that there's there's more collective action based on some of the conversations that you've had again girl well done more grease to your elbow well done thank you, thank you so <laughs> all right much. all right then talk soon okay bye thank you bye bye oh my god i enjoyed that conversation with chioma aguegbo who is you know pretty much one of these people behind the scenes working on movements in Nigeria to make things happen. Really, really, really excited about that. So I um, hope you enjoyed the conversations about, um, about youth um, advocacy in, in Nigeria and in Africa, okay? So I have a couple of announcements for you, okay? I have a couple of announcements for you. So um, let's see. I have a couple of announcements for you. So our next um, our, our next guest on the in Dev Sector series, which is next week, I'm actually in conversations with Dr. Husseini Abdu, the Country Director of Care International, and Femi Belo, the Executive Director of Leap Africa. So either of them will be interviewed next week, but I'll keep you guys updated. You don't want to miss this. This is great conversations. Also, the social impact masterclass e-learning beta launch of ngo fundraising for social impact it's a beta launch that is why it is dirt cheap it's five thousand naira which is approximately ten dollars for the next few hours because i'm going to be opening it up creating my 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 facebook ads putting those videos out and once that gets out the price is going up to twenty dollars for the general public and that alone is for a limited time if you want to participate um, just visit the, the you'll see the, the website down below. It's www.socialimpact.ng slash courses. Also, I am doing for a limited time, free 30 minute discovery calls. So you click on that, you, you look at the uh, link, it's just down below in our discussion, which is bit.ly um, slash SIC discovery call. So guys, let us continue to work together to change the world, continue to be an advocate for your communities. Um, my job 
um, as a host of the development sector series is to continue to connect the development sector to the public, to continue to connect civil society to the public because we're doing great work. The only thing that is um, um, keeping Africa and Nigeria afloat and has not turned into a complete failed state, you know, has not um, turned into an anarchy like places like Afghanistan, no offense, and, um, you know, my heart goes out to the people, is because of civil society. So we need to stay connected and we need to know what is happening and we need to continue to do what we need to do to change the world. Again, guys, thank you so much for watching and let's change the world together. You all take care and have a wonderful rest of the week.